Guten Morgen ähm, und herzlich willkommen auch am zweiten Tag der Berlin Music Week ähm, World Conference. Ähm, schön, dass doch schon so viele von euch da sind, trotz der tollen, aber eben auch letztendlich sehr späten Veranstaltungen gestern. Ähm, wir legen auch direkt los und zwar äh, mit einer Keynote von Paul Resnikoff. Und ähm, der wird uns, ähm, also wer Paul nicht kennt, er ist der Gründer und Herausgeber von ähm, Digital Music News und ist somit eine der Informationsquellen, wenn es um das internationale Musikbusiness geht. Ähm, wir können uns, glaube ich, auf eine sehr, sehr spannende Präsentation und eine spannende Keynote freuen, ähm, denn Paul wird uns gleich die 13 hinterhältigsten und ähm, auch meist verbreitetsten Lügen des äh, internationalen Musikbusiness ähm, verraten. Von daher, yeah, please welcome on stage, Paul. Very curious about your presentation. And of course, um, if you have any questions, um, we, can, we have some space in the end um, to answer that. Thanks. Thanks for getting up this early to listen to this very important information. So, I'm going to talk a lot about the music industry in 2014, but I thought I would start and ask you what you think the music industry might look like in 2014. So, imagine it's 2014 and the next Mozart has already been born. He or she is living amongst us right now, living in Berlin, too young to compose so far, but by 2024, we'll be hearing the first works of this great Mozart, who will change the face of the music industry forever. Creativity will explode. Everything we think about music will be completely different. Now, what if I told you there are 1,000 Mozarts already born, living in villages and cities all around the world, ready to create the most amazing music you've ever heard. Everything that will happen from these new Mozarts will change your concept of music. You won't even call it music anymore. The amazing cultural and musical revolutions of the Renaissance, followed by the Romantic and Classical periods, will seem so basic, so pedestrian, based on everything that's about to happen in the next 10 years. <clears throat> the whole idea of an artist being unhappy on pills and drugs, not accepted by society, struggling with their creativity, this will become a thing of the past. In 10 years time, artists will become so amazingly accepted and validated, there will be no need for them to do drugs. They won't have to overdose at age 27. They can live full, productive, creative lives. They will be happy artists. In fact, music fans and people in general will no longer need to use drugs or pills. Forget about the medicated society that we live in. These will no longer be necessary. The music that will come out in the next 10 years will be so unbelievably creative and evocative that it will cure ills that we currently need pills for. You will become so happy with the next wave of music that pharmaceuticals will no longer be needed. In fact, leading researchers today are determining ways to replace pills with music so, if you have a nervous anxiety disorder, one of these 1,000 Mozarts can help you out. In fact, music will be designed specifically to help cure a myriad of different ills, all naturally, without any side effects except joy. And the best part of this picture, in 10 years, the artists that create this amazing music will be making money. They will be living happy, economically fulfilled lives. Hundreds of thousands of artists earning a decent middle class wage, 
no more poverty, no more starving on the streets and busking for dimes or euros. No, these artists will be living healthy lives, well-rounded lives with good families. So that's what the music industry is going to look like in 10 years. This sounds pretty good, right? Now, what if I told you that there is a different way that the music industry might evolve? In 10 years, the music industry could be completely different. The music industry in 2024 could be a disaster. The complete opposite. Unfortunately, the music industry could be riled by meteorological, environmental, and geological disaster, uprooting the very foundations of what we call the music industry. We will no longer have any stability. Everything will be up in the air. Everything will be tempestuous. It will feel like we were invaded by an enemy force that wants to destroy us. You can't even go outside. As you can see, the music industry in 2024 is going to be awful. Pillars of the music industry will crash. They will fall to the ground. It'll be so hard to create music because everything is being destroyed. The minute you create a note, poof, it disappears into nothing. The creativity of our forebears will dwarf anything new that we create. <clears throat> The barren landscape of the music industry will affect all musicians, all labels, all rights owners. This will be a miserable place for everybody. So, which version of the music industry would you prefer to have in 10 years, if I were to give you the choice? The music industry of 2024, like this, or the music industry of 2024 that looks like this? Which one? You can pick whichever one you want. <laughs> Which one do you want? Okay. That's a very good point. That's a very good point. Sometimes dark, depressing environments produce the best music. But what if the dark, depressing music could actually be sold and the, those dark, depressing authors could receive a lot of money for what they, they make? That's more like this version. But <clears throat> the current music industry actually looks more like this instead of like this. It's a complete train wreck. Nobody really knows where they stand. There aren't any codified business models that have been reproduced and worked over and over and over again. We don't have a stable business model. It's unclear how an artist should go about going out and making money. Most artists are confused about the different rights channels that they, they are entitled to. When they write a song, there's confusion and chaos. Even successful artists are unsure of where they stand. Unfortunately, everything that I mentioned in the beginning about massive creativity and thousands of Mozarts and no pills was kind of how we were thinking about the music industry in 2004. The only problem is that almost none of it happened. And so here we are with this disaster of a music industry, and we're still believing a lot of the lies and myths that we started in about 2004. We're lying to ourselves. We're telling ourselves that this music industry is a lot better than it actually is, that there are more channels, more opportunities, and a lot more blue sky than actually exists. Unfortunately, through lies, we invest money in the wrong places. We spend our efforts doing the wrong things. And we think we're having success when we're not. It's not a good way to go about a career as a rights owner or as an artist. And with that, I present the 13 most insidious pervasive lies of the modern music industry. The first lie, great music will naturally find its intended audience. If you just make the best music, the audience that wants that music will find it. Your fans will come to you. The internet is such an open, lubricated channel that whatever you release 
will find an audience that loves you. Just focus on the music and everything else will take care of itself. Unfortunately, and this is very sad, but even the most incredible musicians have problems reaching an intended audience. So much great music is just completely buried. These 1,000 Mozarts, if they even existed, could never find their intended audiences in the current music environment. It's too crowded. There's too much noise. People are too distracted. So what ends up happening is only a few come through. The rest have only modest levels of success. Others are blackened out completely. Which brings me to the long tail. Long tail is a theory once upon a time that said that music that's created, all music, would be consumed even in the smallest quantities, that down the tail, in the niches, smaller audience would rally around smaller artists. We'd no longer have a music economy of big blockbusters. It wouldn't be about Avicii and magic. It would be about artists you'd never heard of. Brass quartets that are doing crazy things that have audiences and manage to tour and survive. This long tail would redefine media completely. No more big blockbusters, all smaller things that you like that are tailored to you. You might even recognize this book. Released in 2006 by Chris Anderson, it, it revolutionized the way we thought about media. We thought that media was gonna change so dramatically that we weren't gonna have Mariah Carey anymore, that it wasn't gonna be about Lil John and Jay-Z. It was gonna be about smaller rappers and artists, and everyone was gonna make a lot more money. Less was a lot more. A lot of a lot less would equal a lot of a lot more. Unfortunately, as the years progressed, the long tail was so thoroughly dismantled in reality and in theory. Study after study showed that the long tail didn't make sense. And major companies, major CEOs of major companies, including Eric Schmidt at Google, roundly dismissed this theory. And so what happens today? Well, theoretically, we have the internet, right? The internet has millions of songs with millions of artists. These millions of songs and millions of artists can be found quite easily. I can go onto the Pirate Bay, for example, and search for an artist no one in this room has heard of. I can search for something I've distributed myself. I can search for an artist that is barely known in Berlin, just starting out. So why are the top downloads always from the same artists? And it's, it's not just the Pirate Bay, okay? I'm talking about iTunes, it's kind of the same artists. Spotify, and these names are all, these, these names are all basically the same, as you can see. Vivo, I mean, we're seeing Taylor Swift, Enrique Iglesias, Nicki Minaj, Jason Derulo, Trey Songs. It's, it's the same thing over and over again. You go to every single platform where theoretically there are millions of songs and millions of artists, and everyone is basically picking the same stuff. It's sort of strange. And if anyone has an argument with that, talk to any average music fan. They know about 10 artists. They listen to about 100 songs. The breadth is not that big. And this isn't just me making this up or looking at some charts. This is in the data. A study, this is going back a few years, but a study done by Nielsen SoundScan showed that 2% of releases account for 90% of all new release sales. So a tiny sliver at the top is selling almost everything. And here's a breakdown. And, and this, is, this is just based on, on, on albums that were sold in the United States. So 76,875 albums were released and sold at least one copy. Of that, uh, the, they, they all went on to sell 113 million copies in the US. Of that total, sales of roughly 100 million, or 88.5%, came from 1,500 releases, or 1.9% of the release total, which means about 2% accounted for 90% of new releases. That is basically the opposite of the long tail theory. Didn't mean to throw so many numbers this early. I hope that you guys are okay recovering, but it's a brutal assessment. But it gets even worse 
it gets even worse because, and I just got this from the pages of Digital Music News, it gets even worse because the artists that are releasing and are on, the, are on this tail, the artists you've never heard of, are not only not getting downloaded or streamed, no one is even noticing they exist. There are four million songs on Spotify that haven't even been played once. Can you guys see this okay? Okay, I know you see her. So forget about one time. I mean, these, the artists themselves haven't even played their own song because okay, so there's four million songs that haven't even been played once. And we see this across every platform. We see this on iTunes. We see this on other streaming platforms. On YouTube, there's even a, there's even a project in which uh, videos that have never been viewed once are promoted. And <laughs> it's, it's just wild how much stuff is not even being listened to. There's your long tail. It's all stuffed with about a few dozen artists and a few hundred songs, and that's it. There are even theorists who pose that most people in the world, if you collectively add, let's say, the societies of the United States, Europe, let's say Western Europe, um, Canada, perhaps Central and South America, that, that the number of songs that people actually care about is about 5,500. And it, it, sounds, it sounds ludicrous. It sounds absolutely, unbelievably low. But actually, when you look at it, it it's kind of fits reality. People really don't know that many songs, and they're not really searching down the tail. Their behavior was a lot different than we thought it was going to be. We were lying to ourselves, and we still are. Which brings me to the third lie, which is that the death of the major label will somehow make it easier for artists to succeed. Unfortunately, for all the ills of the major label system, First of all, the major labels aren't dead, but for all the ills of the major label system, we are losing one of the best sources of financing for new artists. And the reason is this. The biggest platforms and the most influential platforms that exist today, Google, Spotify, iTunes, these platforms are not investing in new artists. Labels invested with the hopes of gaining a return. And for a myriad of reasons, they cannot receive this return anymore. So, Unfortunately, this means that artists have not been able to get the same level of financing, and they've been forced to scramble to other platforms, Patreon, Songkick, Direct Donations, Flatter. There are all sorts of different platforms to try to get, get money from fans. Some of them are working, but it's nothing near the level of financing that the major labels had provided. So I would argue that artists are now worse off as the, as the major labels have not died, I said death, but have greatly been reduced. Which brings me to my next lie, which is that there will be a death of the major label. We've been saying this for more than 10 years, and we continue to tell ourselves that the major label is going to die. But the only problem is their influence still reaches far substantially into platforms like Spotify, into areas like YouTube. In fact, their muscle in a platform like Spotify has become so great that without them, there probably would not be Spotify, the streaming platform that you know. And part of the reason why artists are having so many problems with payouts is because of the huge, huge influence that major labels have over Spotify. They have massive equity shares, they're receiving huge amounts of money, um, and they're doing this for all streaming and downloading providers, not to mention, not to mention YouTube and other uh, outlets as well. They have catalogs that date back decades, and they're using this influence to a very large degree. Not only that, they're using considerable influence on radio and other major platforms to promote new artists, which brings me back to the earlier charts I was showing. Most of the artists that are appearing at the top of iTunes, the Pirate Bay, whatever, are actually coming from major labels. Which brings me to my next big lie that digital formats would somehow produce greater revenues than physical formats. It's just not true. The data shows in absolute stunning fashion that digital formats have never been able to achieve more revenues than our good old CDs and vinyl of old. Here's a simple breakdown of sales. I sort of stretched it out a little too much, but 
think you can get the idea. So this is a breakdown of sales. Just in, this is a US-based graph, okay? Um, which gives some sort of a proxy of what, what it's like in the world. But, so this is, this is sales of all recorded formats, inflation adjusted, from 1973 to 2013. Okay, so as you can see, there's every, basically every type of recording format. The big blue is the CD, okay? And then as you start to go to the right, you have downloads, streaming, uh, sync revenues, and whatever other formats that exist today. There is about a dozen, there, there may be a dozen of them now. And as you can see, the revenues in 2013 are a mere tiny fraction of what they were in 99, 2000, 2001 when physical was basically the only format that you could purchase. So I'm not sure where this, this huge surge in digital revenue is going to come from, but it's certainly not happening right now. Actually, while we're on the topic of uh, different recording revenues, I'll show you a little uh, time-shifting diagram of how recording formats have changed over the past 20, 30 years. So as you can see, the CD was such a dominant format and generating so much cash, but of course that's gone away. And now we're in a world where we have so many different formats on the digital side, but each one of them isn't producing enough or rivaling what the CD once produced. Which brings me to my next lie. The real money is in touring. Unfortunately, artists have started to think or were fantasizing that there was actually a lot of money on the road, that forget about the recording, that you could play shows to devoted fans, and if you could just put 40, 50, 100, 1,000 fans in a, in a club every night, then you can make a good sustaining income. The only problem is that it works for some artists, but for most artists, it doesn't work. And we started to see numbers come back that show that artists are mainly struggling on the road, unless it's an artist that is somehow uh, built very solidly into a festival, has a very large following to begin with, was already a very large artist, or something of that nature. But even established artists like Imogen Heap have complained that it's virtually impossible for her to make money on the road. Others have decided that it's just not worth the effort of, of all the expenditure of gas, lodging, food, uh, money to the promoter. There's a thousand different costs that come into play. And what happens is that most artists are now not even breaking even, they're losing money in the hopes of, of gaining traction on the road. So I would estimate that 95 to 96 percent of artists that go on the road are either breaking even if they're lucky or losing money. The rest is kind of a collection of superstar artists that can charge 200, 250 euros plus a night or they're built into a festival. The next lie that I hope to debunk is that there's an emerging middle class of artists. Unfortunately, we haven't seen any evidence of this existing. The middle class artist would be able to, let's say, raise a family, have enough money to buy a car, groceries, house, the things that middle class people enjoy. Well, over in the United States, well, we're sort of losing our middle class, but there's certainly not a middle class emerging of artists that we can see. Some artists, a very small percentage, are managing to make incomes that, I don't know, 80,000 euros, 90,000 euros, something like that. But for the most part, we're seeing this happening on an anecdotal basis. So we're seeing examples from six, seven, 10, 11, 12 different artists, but we're not seeing any evidence that this is happening on a mass scale. So what we're having is we're starting to enter kind of a third world economy for the music industry, where the artists that are at the top are making huge amounts of money. Okay, the largest ones, Enrique Iglesias, Jay-Z, Beyonce. These artists are doing quite well. And then you basically have everyone else who's either struggling or making no money or forced to do something else. That's kind of how we're living in 2014. The next lie we've told ourselves is that a Kickstarter can and will build careers. Well, it's kind of the same thing. We've seen it happen for a few artists, Amanda Palmer, uh, Toad Wet Sprocket had an interesting uh, Kickstarter campaign. So we're seeing some examples of, of artists actually making significant money on Kickstarter. And I could probably rattle off three or four more. The only problem is most artists are getting on Kickstarter trying to fund an album, maybe making enough for the album, maybe not, and we're not hearing anything about that. 
So we've never seen an upsurge of artists making any money on Kickstarter beyond maybe a little bit of scratch for an album. We've only seen it happen at the top. And then the tough part about Amanda Palmer is that her victory, she made over a million dollars on Kickstarter, it has been argued that her victory was actually fueled by her initial relationship with a major label. The next lie I hope to debunk is that Spotify is somehow your friend. Spotify has interests that are probably not aligned with yours, or not entirely aligned with yours. The Spotify business model is focused on a liquidation event and making investors very, very wealthy, and making the major labels who supply them with content very, very wealthy. These are the top three objectives of Spotify. So if putting your music on Spotify means more fans will find you, that's, that's good. You'll have some visibility. But please do not expect to receive any substantial income from this platform. <laughs> it will not happen for you. If you have an utterly massive amount of streams, you may make some money. But that, again, is the extreme minority that we're seeing. So Spotify is not your friend. Streaming providers are not your friend. Google and YouTube are not your friend. We've seen this recently. YouTube exists on a, a system that is extremely hostile towards content creators. Essentially, their system says, well, we're going to follow a system codified by, by, in US copyright laws, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. It is quite different in Germany, so I, I want to make sure I distinguish there. But in the US and many other nations, the approach is, well, a video appears of your music. Now you have to rip it down. And the same is true for Google search. So essentially, they get your content. You have to spend all day trying to rip it down. They gain the most value of it. And then they pay you a micro penny for every stream. It's not a good deal. It's a great deal for them. It's a horrible deal for content owners and artists. And it's not getting any better. So now we've, we've even seen YouTube, as they've graduated to a, a subscription platform, almost declaring war on independent labels. They've issued contracts that are bullying. They've demanded terms that are unfair. They've demanded first access to music over other streaming platforms. They've tried to dramatically reduce the level of freedom and income that independent labels would make. These are not your friends. I'm not saying don't put your music on these platforms, but oftentimes it's not even your choice. It's something to think about. The 11th lie. I hope to debunk, is that if somehow Pandora could just lower their royalties, they could then, then survive and really help all the artists out there. Well, Pandora has grown uh, in the markets of the United States and Australia. Actually, do you guys know Pandora in Germany? Kind of. Yeah. Well, Pandora has become even with, without being able to penetrate Europe, has become basically one of the largest internet radio streaming provider in the world. And there are going to be other competitors. Uh, iTunes Radio is one example. They have global licenses. But the controversy that we're facing in the United States is that Pandora has evolved to become the largest platform, but they aren't making a profit. And the amount of money that they pay back to artists is stunningly, stunningly low. Not only that, they're trying very, very hard in Congress and in copyright tribunals to lower those royalties as well. So, so Pandora is basically only working for listeners in a, a cadre of about a dozen different executives at the top. Unfortunately, we're seeing headlines like this all the time as it relates to Pandora. I fear that we'll see this from other internet radio providers as well. Each stream pays so little that publishers and recording owners and artists are seeing unbelievably small checks. So 3.1 million plays on Pandora equals $39, and we've seen far worse than that. And the, the 12th lie is t-shirts, that somehow <laughs> you can sell enough t-shirts to keep yourself going on the road. Well, here's what I'll say about t-shirts. I endeavored to research and find 20 artists who are making money in a sustainable, good way. They were making an income, a sustainable income off of t-shirts. I could not find one. And 
if you tell me that Bob Marley or Journey or Red Hot Chili Peppers are making money off of T-shirts, I would argue that, yes, they are, but they're also making money off of hats and necklaces. I mean, they'll make money off of anything. These artists are so big. Smaller artists aren't able to do this. There's some money in T-shirts, but the cost, the distribution, the expense, and the number of people that actually buy T-shirts, it works sometimes. I've seen it work for a lot of metal artists, but for the most part, it's not creating sustainable revenue. But you should sell T-shirts. I do think you should sell T-shirts. Just don't create unrealist, unrealistic expectations around them. And my 13th lie, streaming is a future that is good for you. Streaming will most likely be the dominant form of music consumption in five years. And in many countries, it is easily, easily the most dominant form. Uh, I point you no further than Sweden, Denmark, Norway. Um, I don't even know what the ratios are like in Germany. I know that in the US, uh, downloads are declining at a clip of double digit percentages every year. Um, and then by 2019, it's estimated that in the United States, 70% of all music consumption will be happening on streaming. So you can only imagine it'll probably be past 95% in countries like Sweden. So this isn't, this isn't something that you can change or reverse. This is bigger than even the biggest artists. But the proposition that this can help you and give you a sustainable wage, I would caution against, against believing this lie. It is not true. A few artists will make some money. Most artists will not. The models have to work around streaming. But what's even worse about streaming, I found, is that the biggest companies in the streaming space, they may not be here in five years. Companies like Spotify, for example, are wildly unprofitable. Pandora, back in the US, wildly unprofitable. In fact, if these companies don't successfully navigate Wall Street, IPOs, or other liquidation events, acquisitions for $10 billion, they may not be here tomorrow, which means that music fans will work around that. They'll find something else. They'll go to YouTube. They'll do whatever. But it's not clear that this future platform is going to be good for artists or the companies that are the biggest in the space right now. It's going to be, uh, I think, a lot, a lot worse before it gets a lot better, and it's not going to be a smooth transition. Which brings me to the music industry of 2014. It doesn't look like this. But it doesn't look like this either. I would argue that the music industry of 2014 looks something like this. Not horrifically horrible, but you should bring an umbrella. And if you call me a hater or you say I'm a pessimist, I would argue back that I'm, I'm actually more of a realist because what I believe is that with a, with a more realistic idea of where the music industry is, more realistic and impactful decisions result. Over the past 10 years, I've witnessed startups and investors commit hundreds of millions of dollars in capital based on one of the 13 lies that I've, that I've uh, mentioned previously. They've poured tons and tons of money. I've even worked with some of these companies. I've witnessed companies build models on the long tail. There are companies that exist today that are predicated on long tail ideas. Uh, there are companies that are predicated on touring and t-shirts being massive revenue generators for artists, far beyond what is realistic. So if you're an artist, if you're an independent label, if you're a publisher, if you're a major label, if you're a content owner, if you're a brand getting involved in music, you have to know that the music industry is actually a little bit darker than you may have imagined. And with that, I believe you'll make a lot more realistic decisions. This is absolutely not an easy industry. I don't think it's going to get much, much easier over the next 10 years, but I, I have witnessed a lot of survivors and a lot of companies that are making shrewd, measured investments based on reality. That, to me, is the real future of the music industry. All right, thank you for getting up and listening to me.
I kind of lost track of time. Um, okay, good. So we've got plenty of time for questions. I hope I hope there's a bunch. So are there any? Hello. Are there any questions? Okay, okay, can you take the mic? Oh, yeah. Um, okay. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, so uh, I, I actually, one of the other things is uh, I was, so our company is based in Santa Monica, and I mean, I make it to Berlin once every few years, so I'm, I'm dying to meet a lot of companies, artists, anyone here. I, I don't have a huge amount of time, but I hope to, if, if you want to meet with me, I'd love to meet with you is what I'm trying to say. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Paul, for a very interesting and very honest presentation. Um, my only question is, uh, from all the different business models that you have seen, mm -hmm. which one do you reckon is the most successful in terms of all their different interests? I mean, record labels, artists, the listeners. Is there something that you've seen, maybe not work perfect, but at least... Yeah, best in class today. Thank you. Okay. Um, wow. See, I, I'm really hesitant to answer the question because I've seen a lot of zany, weird ideas actually work. And so for this reason, I, I take this very open-minded approach to almost every model, unless it's exactly something that didn't work within a year. Because what I find is... Um, okay, so I, I bumped into a band that was, they decided to do their own Kickstarter. Okay, so they rolled their own Kickstarter, which means they get to determine the terms. Um, they don't have to pay a commission out to Kickstarter. They went um, uh, House for Lions is the name of the band. And so they basically uh, generated, I don't know, I think they generated a few hundred thousand dollars on their own. And the reason why they didn't need Kickstarter is because they felt like they had a good connection with their artists. And so, yeah, that worked, that worked amazingly well for them. And at the beginning of that, I just thought it was interesting. Um, uh, Pretty Lights. I don't know if you're familiar with BitTorrent bundles. Okay, so this is wild. All right, so BitTorrent, right? You think piracy, you think, oh, they're just taking music. Well, yeah, I mean, that's a problem if you're the estate of Bob Marley. But for Pretty Lights, it was sort of, this way of packaging all this content. Um, and are you familiar with BitTorrent and, and how the whole platform works? Okay, so let me, let me explain. Okay, so, so there's file sharing. Okay, so in, in, you know, once upon a time in a music industry long, long ago, there was Napster. Okay, so Napster was swapping of individual files. And then that led to Kazaa. Then that led to LimeWire. And like, these have all been buried and, and are gone. BitTorrent jumped in its place, and BitTorrent is basically a transfer protocol for transferring any type of file, including massively large files like movies, um, discographies, and the methodology is, it's rather, it's rather genius. So, so Bram Cohen um, was, you know, he's credited as like the progenitor, basically, of BitTorrent. And it basically breaks the file down into tiny little bits and then navigates around and distributes the bits to uh, manage the bandwidth issues, okay? So the basic result is if you want the movie 2012 or Oblivion or whatever, you just get it off of BitTorrent and you can have it in three minutes or 10 minutes or whatever your, your connection is. So it's just a massive transfer. Uh, yeah, okay, so... Pirate Bay, right, so you guys probably have seen this, right? So what the Pirate Bay does is the Pirate Bay says, okay, um, Iggy Azalea, that's a new album, so we're going we're gonna to point you to cedars of this album. Okay, so it's, it's almost like a traffic control. They're basically pointing you, it's an index, they're pointing you to places that will help you get the file, okay? So they're basically saying, you already have, the, they're not BitTorrent itself, but they're almost like a tour guide, okay? So it's almost if I said to you, oh yeah, okay, so you wanna check out Berlin, okay, so West Berlin's over there, like East Berlin's over here, and I started to like give you the directions and showed you a subway map and like how to get all the things and, and I, I directed you around, right? So this is what the Pirate Bay is doing, okay? They're basically directing you to whatever you want, and this is, Music, this is movies, television series, discographies, pornography, 
games, whatever. Okay, they're pointing you around. So there's, there's been a thought from the beginning, and this, this started with Napster, okay, that the real way to win was to embrace file sharing and to, to change the food chain, okay? To, so to say, well, okay, so um, my file is being swapped around on Napster. Well, I'm going to try to charge for other things, okay? I'm going to charge for special bundles, um, vinyl, T-shirts, touring, okay? That was, that was sort of the shift in thinking. And it's still with us now. So the lie, I believe, is that things like T-shirts and touring for most artists can make up for the revenue that used to happen from recordings. That to me is, is a lie. But in, in, it has worked for some artists, okay? So Pretty Lights is an example. So what he did is he, he, he tried a concept called BitTorrent Bundles where you take a recording, image, video, um, uh, whatever else, right? Whatever digital assets he could put in. He put them in a bundle and he put it on BitTorrent. And it was some hugely massive number of, of, of downloads of his BitTorrent bundle. I don't know if any of you guys heard about this BitTorrent bundles campaign. But the result was that he did start to see a very huge amount of traffic at his shows as a result of that. So for him, the idea worked. And so this is why I'm almost like, I, I could almost like cry bullshit on my own presentation because this guy just proved me wrong in that, in that respect. I don't think it's... I would respond, if I'm having this argument with myself, I would respond that, well, maybe it works for him, but it's hard to scale. But some artists are having a lot of success doing, doing things like that. Um, there's another startup, for example, um, it's called Slide. Okay, so Slide has an idea in which they said, well, there isn't one place where people go to, um, to, find, to find artists. Okay, so way back in the day, it was MySpace Music. Then everyone thought it was gonna be Facebook. But then Facebook switched to timeline. And there, there isn't one place where I go, oh, yeah, I really just want to go and see artists there. It just, poof, went away. So what Slide wants to do is they want to create an app that would consolidate all of the artists, okay, or at least the artists that you care about, and give you a feed and start to give you a, a way to receive all the amounts of uh, endless releases and, and stuff that are coming from your favorite artists. Because the problem that music fans are facing is that uh, they're even even their favorite artists. They're unaware of shows. They're unaware of remixes. They're unaware of albums coming out. So this, this is trying to solve one of those problems. So yeah, could that work? I, I'm immensely open-minded. I think absolutely. I mean, that, that's just three examples. Sure. Questions? Okay. First then. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hi. Um, so Spotify is not their friends, YouTube either, Google either. What about SoundCloud? Oh yeah, you know, I didn't even talk about SoundCloud. Um, I think SoundCloud has similar, similar problems. Um, SoundCloud actually is, has not paid artists for most of their history, okay? They've only recently said, well, we're gonna pay, we're gonna experiment with a system that pays some of the top content owners, okay? And so, yeah, that, that's, that's a bit confusing, right? Because what do you, what do, you do about that as an artist? Um, I would argue, you know, I've, I've bumped into so many people that wake up to SoundCloud, okay? So they, they wake up, they go, oh man, I got, I've got to check out some remixes. This is, my life is on SoundCloud. I have a writer for Digital Music News who, who just lives on SoundCloud, okay? So if you're an artist, and you have an audience on SoundCloud, that's, that's probably helping you. You're probably not making a lot of money on it, okay? Other artists, I think it just depends on where you stand. If you're a more established artist, having your music easily accessible on SoundCloud, I don't know, I don't know. I think the artist has to determine if that's right for them. And from just an ethical standpoint, I think SoundCloud is moving in the right direction. I know I'm on like the home turf of SoundCloud, so there's probably some SoundClouders here. You might be one of them. I would just, I felt that, <laughs> you have a what? With SoundCloud. With them, okay. Yeah, you know, I just think there's, um, there's an ethical issue that comes up there, right? Which is, uh, you know, they're, they're building a massive business, a very successful one. And that's potentially you know, a multi, multi-billion dollar business in the future. And one that's commanding so much attention and, 
and drawing so much, so much attention in the, in the audio space, is it fair that, that there's not a lot of uh, money being re remunerated back to artists? And, and there's, there's a lot of arguments about that. One is that, well, in remixes, it's difficult to pay artists. But I've met with a startup that can, that can take every element of a remix and figure out who gets paid what. Okay, so I've met with companies that can solve these problems. I, I don't believe it's a technical issue as much as it is an unwillingness to, to sort of do the right thing. Yeah, hi, I'm Rain, um, and I'm a manager of one band called Art Hugo, and I'm just want to ask that, um, what would be the, I don't know, the steps for upcoming artists, if the music is good, or if the, if the feedback is like, like, if you get international, I don't know, guys, Nils Burstein, whatever, some guys say that music is really good, audience is really good, but you just, uh, it's, it's not pop music, and you don't want to be, like, I don't know, Rihanna or them, something like that. It's an alternative scene, and a Spotify, I, for Spotify is not our friend, I know some other streamer channels is not our friend, so how should we proceed to get the gain the market, or what would should be the next steps if we were like, upcoming sort of, the music is really good, we're trying to tour, but how to, I know, make a step without the investment money, it's, it's just the only matter of luck in these days, or, or it's just everybody are hard working, of course, but, what would be the steps would, what the band should do, or what would be the aims without getting, I know, a release in, in a bigger label? Are there any possibilities without being uh, noticed, without being uh, on a big label for yeah. a great, great music uh, unknown band? Thank you. I, I think the answer is yes. Okay, like, I, I get this question a lot. And so, what I don't want, what I don't want you to come out with from this presentation is, that you shouldn't be doing things just because um, it's not a direct payout to you. I'm just urging managers such as yourself and artists and labels to, to weigh the pros and cons of various platforms and ideas because uh, you know it, it may be the pros and the cons are even, right? You may feel that the benefit you're getting from a platform is modest, the, the sum upside, and, fine, do it, right? But I also would say that um, for, for all of the information about, you know, 2% making up 98% and all of that and uh, an extreme concentration of, of attention on um, certain artists, a certain small group of artists, I have noticed that there are a lot of different stories that are happening on a much smaller scale. And if... I'm always surprised that I'll go to a show or I'll talk to someone and I'll find out about an artist that is, has a huge fan base or enough, a substantial fan base, and most people haven't heard of the artist really, okay? So that, that is also happening on, an, on another layer. I don't think it's happening to hundreds of thousands of artists, but I think it may be happening to thousands and tens of thousands of artists who have developed an audience that's substantial enough that they can survive. So I don't think it's the industry. I don't think it's scaled to that point, but I definitely think that it can happen. Um, and you asked about luck. I think luck is um, as important or, or more important than it, than it was in the past because what you're fighting against now, you're not fighting for some big company to say, yes, I will help you. You're fighting against millions of other bands and, and other forms of distraction and noise to try to somehow poke through. And so that can happen, but um, it, it does require, in my opinion, a lot of luck. And, and, and oftentimes, the luck that gets through is something that is extremely creative. Um, I don't know, Vine montages or um, zany YouTube clips or things like that. So it's 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 a period that that I think can reward extremely creative marketing efforts, and combined with luck, yeah, I think things can happen. Yeah, yeah. Yes, hello. Well, thank you very much for your interesting presentation. Thank you. I have uh, two questions. Um, what what needs to happen that this uh, kind of ongoing precarization of small artists reverses? Is it a technological issue? Is it something that uh, needs to be changed in the system of rights or something? I don't know. And the second question is, um, as a small artist, 
uh, which are my friends nowadays? Okay, let's, let's talk about your friends. Okay, that's a very good question. Your best friends are the ones that are giving you stuff, okay? So the fans that, that pay for stuff. And I'm not saying fans that listen to your music without paying you are your enemies. They're not, okay? Because they can lead to... Without, without those fans, you wouldn't have basically the fans that pay you a lot. Right? But the fans that are paying you a lot, that are buying your vinyl, that are financing your Kickstarter campaign, that are uh, sending you money on Patreon, that are going to your shows, um, that are buying your T-shirts, that are doing these things... Those are your best friends, okay? And then the other, the other best friends you have are people who are helping you on a day-to-day -day basis, whether that's um, other members in the band, producer who's giving you a great rate or studio time, or um, friends who are helping you load and unload equipment. Um, there's numerous examples of people who like just want to be part of it, okay? Those are absolutely your friends. For the rest of it, um, it's about money, right? So if you're making a lot of money off of vinyl, then vinyl is your friend, okay? And everyone along that chain is a friend of yours. So the guy you know at a production facility who's helping you make um, a light blue vinyl because that matches the color motif of your band, and you're selling those, that it's a friend. This, this whole chain is working for you. Um, Let's think of who else might be your friends. Uh, let's say you sell a lot of like physical merchandise, uh, physical um, recordings. Maybe you sell CDs. A lot of artists actually sell CDs. Um, jazz, classical. Uh, I know the, a lot of those artists are selling CDs. So that the CD is your friend. Okay. Um, in the case of Pretty Lights, BitTorrent Bundles was a friend. Okay. That actually created a model in which uh, fans were actually attending shows. Okay. So. Now, let's say I go, all right, let's talk about SoundCloud. OK, SoundCloud, your friend? Well, that's a probably a more tricky question. Um, are you getting a lot of traction on the platform that's leading to other things that are helping you uh, buy food and <laughs> buy equipment and buy, um, record, uh, produce new recordings and tour? If the answer is not so clear, then it, that's not clearly your friend, right? So it doesn't mean. Uh, rip down your music from SoundCloud. It just means that that's not clearly your friend. Um, is uh, let's let's switch over to like YouTube. Okay, so um, are you constantly getting co uh, are bad copies of your music appearing on YouTube? And uh, you know, is it are, is your is your music being used in other other videos? And you don't like it, and you're constantly having to police it, and not getting a lot of money, and it's just a hassle. And you're not making any money off of that, or new fans. That's not a friend. Okay, um, how about a label that you signed with that is um, giving you a h horrible time, asking you to change your musical style in a way you don't want to, and not paying you properly? That's your enemy. So I would just say like, there's, there's, there's going to be like two dozen different examples that you can look at. And some are clearly friends. They're paying you. They're helping you. They're helping you grow. They're pushing the trajectory upwards. Others are on the opposite extreme. And I think it makes sense to take inventory of, of all of them. Yeah, that's a big that, that that's like a big picture question. Um, that's that's tough. Um, that, that's a that's a very that's a very long discussion. Uh, I think that. Um, What's happening in Germany with GEMA and YouTube and some of the battles there, um, I, I would regard as healthy. And what I mean by that is that, yeah, I, are you guys uh, GEMA members or? Well, okay. From the States. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, you see this, all the German streets about it. Like, GEMA has one of these rainbow things where you can sign up and you Right, because what 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 I think is uh, a little, you know, to like 
jump in on what you guys are saying. What's kind of effed up, you know, about uh, the copyright legal system as it stands in the U.S. and it, there are market differences in the, between the U.S. and German copyright systems. But you know, the basic the basic legislation um, in the United States was created. Uh, the DMCA legislation was created in a period of basically the late 90s, when the the online environment looked wildly different. I mean, this is like a completely different environment when user generated wasn't even a buzz code. It um, things were just starting, and so what you've started to see is a sort of a bastardization of existing law, and particularly of the DMCA. You've seen entire business models. Um, built around the DMCA, and it's, it's basically a giant loophole. So I'll give you an example. Um, so there's a reason why um, when you hop on a Google, you can find uh, pirated music quite easily, OK? The reason why is because they function on a takedown, uh, a DMCA takedown notice approach. So basically, the rights owner has to approach Google and say, take this down. And that's true for file sharing lockers. That's true for GrooveShark. That's true for some of the most popular platforms that exist. The main problem is it, it, it almost makes no sense, right? Because what we're seeing is that um, the same bad actors are uploading the same infringing content every time. All right. So, they're uploading like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of files that are all illicit. The sites, like certain sites, are are only only trying to get you to illegal content. They're not they're not good actors, but they're not blocked either. And so if if the point and so Google's response is well, we can't police who's doing what, but it doesn't make any sense because they can they can they can police child pornography, right? They've been very successful doing that. They can police. Um, uh, their own search results to, pr to produce results that are more, far more relevant to the topics that you're searching. Um, they remove from search results a, a whole myriad of different sites that are deemed to be bad actors because they're clearly identified as such. So I mean, we're, we're just kind of in this like semantic riddle where they say one thing and, and rights owners say another. But to me, that would be a big step to answer your question um, that would be a big step in the right direction to actually have have a body of law that that makes sense and everyone can agree on. Um, because right now we're just we're just stuck in a loophole, and it's benef it's not it's benefiting Google, it's benefiting YouTube, and it's not benefiting copyright owners at all. It's making their lives miserable. It's making it extremely difficult for them um, to monetize their content. Oh, do we uh, do we hit the time limit? Yeah, All right. The time is up. Okay, okay. Uh, I right. mean, if, if anyone has like, any questions, okay. so they can come to you, yeah, yeah, I guess, and All discuss right. uh, uh, Thanks, all everyone. the issues. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. So, thank uh, Paul, okay. thanks a lot for this wonderful, um, wonderful presentation, My the pleasure. keynote, and a nice discussion. Yeah, thank you. Very interesting. <laughs>